Number two on your outline. Jesus forbids his followers. Now remember, chapter, chapter 5, verse 1, where this sermon started, who's he talking to? He's talking to believers. This is not really even about relationships in the world or with the world, and we've been applying it that way, and I think the applications are good, but we need to recognize that he's actually talking about relationships inside the church. It's, it's heartrending to find out that sometimes people in the church can be more merciful to those on the outside than they are to those on the inside. What's wrong with that? Who should we be quickest to show mercy to? In Galatians, Paul said, especially to those who are brothers in Christ. Jesus forbids followers to condemn one another. Why? Because we're going to be shown mercy. Since we will be shown mercy, we are supposed to show mercy. Now he gives this example, and when somebody brings this uh, passage up to you, and they want to just use that first sentence, that first phrase, judge not lest you be judged, or whatever translation you want to use it in, and they want to stop there, you need to very quickly say, now wait a minute, it's not fair to take Jesus' words out of context, ever, and particularly not in this case, because they can end up meaning exactly the opposite of what he intended them to mean. And so he gives an example here to illustrate what he's talking about. We need to let his example do its work. Look what he says. Why do you see the speck that's in, why do you see the speck that's in the eye of your brother? But the log that's in your eye you don't even think about it. How will you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye and look, the log in your eye. It's a verbal clause. It gives it more from a drama. I like that. And look, the log in your eye. Or the beam. Verse 5 is very cutting. This is some of the harshest language Jesus ever used. And this is the only place that he is recorded to have used it against his own followers. Usually, when he said hypocrite, or hypocrites, he was talking to whom? The Pharisees. But here, he's talking about a believer, and he's talking to his followers. He says, hypocrite, first take the log out of your eye, or the beam out of your eye, and then you will see to take the speck from the eye of your brother. The fact that Jesus uses the word hypocrites here really catches our attention because it's harsh language for him. Uh, and it's almost like the account where Jesus looks at Peter and calls him Satan. He just shakes you to the cold. And so we, we should pay close attention for that reason and for nothing else. He gives us a ridiculous example, not one that should surprise us since he grew up doing what? He was a carpenter, right? Uh, and so he's talking about sawdust and beams and this kind of thing. And obviously he's not talking about wood in people's eyes. He's talking about what? What is this symbolic of? Sin. Sin. Absolutely. Uh, he's saying this person has a small sin in their life, and you come up and try to help them out, you've got this blaring sin in your life, and you think you're going to be able to see straight enough to help them with their sin. But what would you say about verse 8 and the whole idea of being judgmental or having good judgment. What does verse 8 tell us? How does verse 8 change the way we look at verse 1? Judge not lest you be judged. But in verse, I'm sorry, excuse me, verse 5. My eyes are getting worse and worse and worse and that little bitty 5 looked like an 8 to me. I got those no line bifocals and I just, I hate having to do this and do this. That. <laughs> verse 5. How does verse 5 nuance the way that we look at verse 1? Verse 1 says, judge not lest you be judged, but verse 5 tells us what? Then. Then use that judgment when you're dealing with others. We judge ourselves first. Then we can do what? We can, we can be discerning and we can help one another. 
What about Matthew 18, where Jesus said, when somebody sins against you, what do you do? What do you do? Before that, when somebody sins against you in the church, what do you do? You go tell them. And if they say, oh, I'm so sorry, then you do what? They say, forget you. I'm right, you're wrong. Then, then you bring somebody else. They, if, they, uh, if they repent, you're good. If they don't, then what? That's exactly right. Say that real loud. If, you, if they don't repent, you don't have to forgive them. Yes, ma'am. That is absolutely correct. Because if they don't repent and you forgive them, that's what? That's cheap. Grace. That's the first time I've ever heard. Well, I'm glad you were here tonight. I'm glad you were here tonight. The rest of them are wrong and I'm right. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm right. Not because I am me, but because that's what the Bible says. This whole idea of forgiveness is troubling when you really look at it. And it troubled Peter one time and he asked Jesus about it. Well, how many times should I forgive somebody that sinned against me? Seven? He thought he was being very magnanimous. Jesus said, nah, seven times seventy. You go and tell your brother what he did against you. And when he repents, you forgive him. Because if you forgive him without him repenting, what's that? That's Columbine. Columbine made me sick to my stomach. Not just because of the people who were killed in the school, but before the bodies were removed from the school, there were kids standing outside, and they were just doing what they'd been taught by their parents and their culture. I, I don't have anything against them. They're reflecting what they've been taught. But before the bodies had been removed from the school, they were standing outside with placards saying, we forgive you, whatever the guy's names were. I can't remember them now. First of all, they're dead. How do you forgive them? They didn't ask to be forgiven. They didn't admit that what they did was wrong. As far as we know, they died thinking that they did right or that it was okay for them to do that. You can't forgive somebody like that. So let's go through this again. Some of you have heard this before, but Tammy's just pointing out the fact that some people still don't know this. When somebody has harmed us and sinned against us, we want reconciliation as believers. We want grace, we want mercy, we want compassion, and that's what we shoot for. And if they're willing to repent, as hard as it is, we've got to reach deep down inside where the Holy Spirit is, and we've got to give them that, that forgiveness. If they don't repent, then what do we do? Well, there's two choices. One choice is to, uh, is to take action against them, to be vindictive make them happy. Is that a live option for a Christian? What does Romans chapter 12 tell us? Or chapter 13? We're Christians. We need to know this. This is basic. This is Christianity 101. But a lot of people struggle with this. We know we're supposed to forgive somebody and what the culture has done is they've taken Christian forgiveness and they have twisted it and they've turned it into something that it is not. They've turned it into cheap Grace. If anybody does anything wrong for any reason whatsoever, you automatically forgive them. No questions asked. That is not biblical. It's not biblical. It's wrong. It cheapens grace. What's the third option? By the way, if you, you need to go read Romans 13 later on. Please do that because it will tell you that we never take, what's that R word? Revenge. Revenge. Revenge is not... In fact, when somebody is sinning against us and they're not repentant, what are we supposed to do? We wash our hands. We move, move back because you might get hit by the lightning, right? We put them into God's hands. Now, this is very important because some people as adults... I'll go back to my molestation example. Some people as adults were molested by a family member when they were younger, and the family member's dead. They don't know what to do. And you can take that example and multiply it in other ways where you're literally in a situation where you cannot forgive that person. And what a psychologist will tell you is that you forgive them anyway. Is that right? Now what that psychologist is trying to get you to do is to lighten your own load. To make you feel better. But even people who do that, they just never quite feel right. There's just something about that that doesn't work. 
for some reason. And it doesn't work because it's not right. Now, biblical is not true. What's the third option? If, if we can't forgive them, if, if we're not supposed to exact revenge, what is the third option? Well, the third option is exactly what I just told you about a minute ago that Jesus did on the cross. What did he do? He put them in God's hands. He said, God, I can't do anything about this. I can't forgive them. They're unrepentant. They didn't realize that they're doing anything wrong. They just think they're doing the job. I'm not going to take revenge against them because that's not who I am. I'm here dying on the cross for the sins of the world, not to take revenge on the person who has put me on the cross. So what's the third option? The third option is to place them in the hands of God. And if God chooses to forgive them, so be it. If God chooses to judge them, so be it. It's with Him now, not with me. That's the third option. That's what we need. Now, I've helped people do that in my, in my office before who have come into these kinds of things. Like in the example that I gave, molestation as a child, the person's dead, nothing you can do about it. Can't forgive them. You can't even take revenge on them because they're dead. So what do you do? You have to pray and say, Father, you forgive them. Or judge them. It's up to you. And you're free. You're free of your responsibility. You're free to begin to heal from what they've done for you. Well, we need to stop here and come to the table. I hope that our discussion tonight will give us a little bit more insight into the real value of the bread and the cup. Because this is exactly what we've been talking about.